If I may begin by asking each of you two questions. Who are you, and why have you come? Uh, to be frank, your questions, although clearly simple, yet despite this, or perhaps because of their very simplicity, either way, they have caught me completely off guard. The very question, who are you, seems to echo in my mind. Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? I am unsure whether it is willing me to give an account of my entire life to date, or simply demanding an immediate and equally direct response. After all, how does one give an account of who they are without making a list of what they have achieved are indeed not achieved in a particular field throughout their life. Perhaps I speak out of turn here, but I certainly feel that it would be inappropriate to address you as one would a police officer or indeed a custom official. The words I am about to utter seem inappropriate, inadequate, but perhaps I have none better. Perhaps there are simply no words to describe the following. But there is a level of thought where words have little or no part to play. For are words not made for a certain exactness of thought? Well, there are many things which lie beyond that which can easily be measured or spoken of. But the laborious task of articulation clearly lies with each of you, so that I may arrive at an understanding as to who you are and indeed what is the purpose of your visit. Why, well, yes, of course. Yes. If I may begin by addressing the latter of your questions, why have we come here? And perhaps during the course of answering this very question, you may come to understand something of who we are. Certainly. But for now, if you give me your name, simply for ease of communication. Yes, of course. In recent years, I have gone by the name Pierre Sogol. It is a moniker that I received when I spent some time in a monastery. I was referred to as Father Sogol, Per Sogol, by the brothers because of a tendency I had at that time to reverse any statement proposed to me. Sogol being a rather childish, if not somewhat pretentious, anagram. On leaving the monastery, I was in need of a name with a good ring to it. Besides, it reminded me of a rule of thought that once served me well. The man standing next to me is a highly regarded author, René Domal. He has published many books and his writings have contributed to this very expedition. In fact, without René's insight, the expedition may very well not have taken place at all. It's kind of you to say so, but I am unsure as to whether that was the case. You disagree? Yes and no. Yes and no. I assure you I do not mean to be evasive by responding in such a manner. Without doubt, René's contribution will become apparent during the course of our meeting. Of what Willem should become apparent is Sogol's belief and his utter conviction in the possibility of this expedition, and indeed his tireless efforts to persuade us of its feasibility. I am sure that each had a role and that the success of the expedition was down to all your efforts. And finally, what is your name? My name is Ivan Laps, and I was invited in part because I am a linguist, and it was thought that my research in this field may be of some use in facilitating communication between our two parties, for it was presumed that we would not share a common language, not an unreasonable presumption given the circumstances. But thankfully, I have other skills. I know my way around a boat and I have been climbing for many years now. Ivan is indeed a very accomplished climber and is more familiar than most with the particular difficulties of high altitude climbing. So if I may return to you, Sogol, perhaps now you would begin by giving me an account of the purpose of your visit. For some reason, I am reminded of a phrase which I came across during my time as a novice. It is from the poet Novalis. Where are we really going? always home. These words have always pleased me immensely, but it is only now that I have truly come to realize their full significance. 
when I look back now, it seems that I have spent the greater part of my life in search of a home. Yes, my behaviour was that of someone who had lost something precious, something irretrievable, constantly in search of information that would substantiate my beliefs. For I believed that somewhere on the surface of the globe a world existed, a world other to our own, a belief that few would find plausible, and so few were willing to assist me on this matter, despite the enormous benefits. I had come to the belief that on this world there existed a people far more advanced than ourselves, who hold the key to many things that as yet remain a mystery to us, and I fear will continue to do so. It is my belief that a man cannot reach truth directly by himself. An intermediary has to be present, a force, human in certain respects, yet transcending humanity in others. Mankind is clearly in need of some assistance. Otherwise, you are simply looking into a mirror in search of an ideal image of your world. This can only be a self-defeating task. A mirror can only reflect that which is before it. Of course, you can challenge repressive authorities, but these authorities will re-establish themselves over the course of time, as has happened many times before. Yes. Unfortunately, history is littered with many such examples. Sadly, this is so. Yes. In short, it is here that I would hope to gain access to this information. For mankind has learnt little or nothing from its past, and I fear it is destined to continue to stumble amongst its own feelings, of which there are many, far too many. And to my shame, all are of our own making. Given these feelings and a need of answers, an expedition to this very place became increasingly urgent. So, correct me if I'm wrong, the geographical location of your destination was as yet unknown. Yes, as was the route, which of course had implications regarding what means of transport was the most appropriate, not, not to mention issues of money and, and the time such an expedition would take. Having just witnessed this outburst by Rennie, it is hard for you to imagine him as a prophet, even a reluctant one but I can assure you he is a prophet nonetheless. For the event he sounds and the truth he sounds, do not sing of that world which is already known. He speaks of new worlds, of unknown worlds, of places where the truth cannot not exist. Where were we to look? Where could we begin? I had already covered the world, poking my nose into everything, into all religious sects and mystic cults. But it all came down to the same dilemma. Maybe yes, maybe no. Why should I stake my life on one and not the other? However, despite all this, I decided that all my efforts must be directed towards discovering such a place, even if in spite of my certainty I was the victim of some monstrous illusion. I would lose nothing in the attempt, for apart from this hope, all life lacked meaning. So, despite your determination, it seems that there was still much to be discovered. There were many calculations that needed to be made, and this proved difficult. There were times, no matter where I looked, I was greeted with little more than a possibility. I walked the length of many paths. Some I clearly should not have taken at all. Others I should have turned back much earlier, instead of travelling their length. But sometimes one has to travel a length, if only to know for sure that it is the wrong path taken. Yes, it proved difficult. Indeed, there were times when it seemed to be almost impossible for me to access any information that would corroborate my beliefs. But it is not necessary to substantiate one's beliefs. Either one believes or one does not. I know it is not required that one's beliefs be subjected to external confirmation or indeed the affirmation of others. But when one is challenged at every turn, it is without doubt a difficult place to find oneself. I was unable to discuss this matter, for when I did, I inevitably met with resistance, if not ridicule. Clearly, these were onerous circumstances for you to operate within. These circumstances were far from ideal. But as time passed, it became increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to accept this place as merely allegorical. This precious world, 
for those who are tired of the failings of our own could not be simply a product of my imagination. It is one thing to believe, but it is another to initiate an expedition based solely on one's intuition. Belief. But if a man may not act on his beliefs, I ask you, what should he act upon? Just as he should not be precluded from doing something because he has not all the necessary information to hand, surely if the required information is gathered over the course of time, then there is no reason that the desired act should not take place. The strength of Sogol's belief could not be contested. There was clearly a sturdy foundation upon which to build any argument. There was evidently sufficient grounds to initiate this expedition. I was under no illusions as to the difficulties involved in such an expedition. But as yet, I remained alone in my conviction. Despite all, I believed it to be possible. And this, I add, was no longer simply based on a hunch or a feeling that one knows something but is unable to prove it. Instead, it was an instantaneous moment of seeing, like that of discovery or of wonder itself. For the basic act of understanding is the instantaneous act of intuition, of certainty. And so you remained alone in your conviction. Indeed, I was alone. And this was not something that escaped my notice. For it was not simply a matter of whether I believed or not. The success of the expedition depended on the assistance of others, without whom it would simply remain an impossibility, a reverie. So you can only imagine my profound delight when I came across an article by René. Now there was another who was familiar with the same reality as myself. Clearly this changed everything. This article had been published in a little-known periodical, Rêve de Fossil, and spoke of this very place, where there exists a mountain far greater than Mount Everest. This mountain is extremely important to its people, for the mountain is a means of uniting the earth with the heavens. I wasted little time in contacting René, mm. addressing the letter to his publishers, if memory serves me. Yes, that is correct. I recall receiving the letter in question, the unfamiliar handwriting on the envelope, upon which was my name and the address of the publishers, to whom I had contributed the article in question, and from whom your letter had indeed been forwarded. I must admit, on reading your letter, I was unsure as to whether it had the effect of a revitalizing breath of fresh air or a disagreeable draft. In any case, I telephoned you as you requested without delay. Well, I recall that you were prompt in your response. I took this as a sign of your interest. Well, the fact that you included as many as five or six different telephone numbers so that I could call you at different times of the day or the night suggested a certain amount of impatience. Well, it was an urgent matter, I think you would agree. Why I phoned, I may never know. What I did know was that my life had become all too stagnant of late. I had almost forgotten the article to which your correspondence referred. After all, it had appeared three months earlier in the May edition. It made me more than a little uneasy that, that someone should have taken me seriously, even tragically, with a literary fantasy which I may have been carried away with at the time. Prompted to reread the article, given that it had already faded in my memory, it was, I would have to consider on reflection, a rather hasty study of the symbolic significance of the mountain in ancient mythologies. This had been my preferred field of study for some time, and perhaps, naively, I believed that I understood something about the subject. I had written in substance that the mountain is a bond between the earth and the sky. The earth and the heavens. Not the earth and the sky. The mountain is a bond between the earth and the heavens. Its solitary summit reaches the sphere of eternity and its base spreads out into the foothills of the world of mortals. Yes. It is the way by which man can raise himself to the divine, and indeed whereby the divine can reveal itself to man. So your article spoke of what constituted this bond. Yes. Now that Schnei Nebo and Olympus have long since become what mountaineers call cow pastures, and even the highest peaks of the Himalayas are no longer considered inaccessible today. All these summits have therefore lost their analogical importance. The symbolic is now to take refuge in a total mythical mountain such as Mount Mare. 
But of course, the very fact that Mare is no geographical location means it loses all its persuasive significance. As you well know, for a mountain to facilitate man's entry into the heavens, its summit must be inaccessible, but its base accessible to a human being as nature has made him. It must be unique, and furthermore, it must exist geographically. For the door to the invisible must be visible. So it seems your article clearly spoke of this place, and yet, despite this, you had some reservations as to its very existence. I suppose. If taken literally, my article did indeed imply that I believed in its existence, yes, that, that somewhere on the surface of the globe there was a world other to our own where there exists a mountain far greater than anything previously known. Clearly a belief that was to any so-called sensible person an absurdity. But here was someone who had taken me at my word and furthermore was talking about attempting an expedition. A lunatic? A practical joker? Or simply a man of letters? Look, your article clearly spoke of such a place, of its very existence. And if I may add, it spoke of it in some detail. The place exists, therefore it was up to us to discover it. It was simply a matter of calculation. There were two of us now. Not that this made the task twice as easy, but what once seemed impossible had now become possible. So when and how did you come to believe in this place? It was on meeting Sogol that I came to believe. Though at least while I remained in his company. I was prepared to follow him in this crazy expedition, but as I neared home, I would again find all my old habits. I began to imagine my colleagues at the office, the writers I knew, my friends. Their response on hearing an account of the conversation that I'd just had. Yes, I could all too well imagine their sarcasm, their skepticism, and God forbid their pity. I began to suspect myself naive, a credulous fool. But it was my wife, Renée's response which quite frankly surprised me the most. Despite the derisive manner in which I reiterated the contents of the meeting I had had with Sogol earlier that day, on hearing what I said she responded calmly with the following words. Well, he is right. You and I know that. These words were followed by, go pack your trunk tonight. There has been too much time wasted on this matter already. And so it was I decided I would make the journey. I would follow this curious man on this crazy expedition. I realize I'm being rather insistent on this matter, but I have some difficulty in understanding your position. For your writings clearly spoke of this world, and as such clearly contributed to the advancement of the expedition, and yet you still needed the reassurance of others. To be frank, I'm unsure as to why this was the case. I clearly lacked Sogol's courage and conviction, and indeed his moral fortitude, but the truth is that I was myself uncertain as to why this was. Perhaps I could be accused of concealing my writings under the mask of the allegorical, and those familiar with my writings were all too willing to accept it as such. The truth is that we live in a world where if one challenges that which is deemed impossible, you will most probably be judged insane. For it is an immense task to extend the realm of the possible. This in part may explain René's caution. It certainly impacted in many of my decisions. It must be difficult to live in such a world where limits are readily placed upon one's beliefs and indeed where so much seems to be deemed impossible. Without doubt, it has untold effects on one's thoughts and actions, but thankfully some thoughts, beliefs, become so deeply contained within the mind that not even reason can edit or corrupt them. It is such thoughts that extend the realm of the possible but it was, and indeed is, an immense task to extend the realm of the possible. 
For man as a collective subject feels he has to set limits, continually renouncing any progress that may occur. That which is deemed impossible remains so. The line has been drawn and it will not at any stage be redrawn. But thankfully the space of the possible is far greater than has been assigned to it. Yes. Perhaps if one believes it to be. But does not everything begin and end with belief? Clearly, René's article was extremely important to you, Sugao. I cannot overestimate its importance. Quite simply, reading René's words changed everything. Those words which I had waited to read for what seemed to be a lifetime. To encounter such evidence of interest on the part of another, this for me could only be described as a blessing. It was as if each word I read came to function as a stepping stone together forming many paths. These paths stretched out before me, guiding me. But as you are aware, it was Sogol who identified these paths by insisting on their very presence. And indeed, all but Sogol would view them as impassable, as unnavigable. All that was required was a map. This was a question of calculation, and given time, this could be addressed. It was simply a matter of days, perhaps a week. But now it seemed possible. There were two of us, and soon we would be joined by a third, Ivan. So, Ivan, how did you become involved in this expedition? I was asked to attend a meeting along with some others, all of whom declined the invitation to join this expedition for various reasons. Many were unconvinced, others could not afford the time. So, you were alone in accepting the invitation? Yes, but even to this day, like René, I am unsure as to why I accepted it for I would be considered a cautious man. But I accepted it without reservation. Perhaps it was simply a matter of curiosity getting the better of me. Besides, each of us possesses a passion for mountaineering. In fact, Segal is a professor of mountaineering, amongst other things. So, you were a professor of mountaineering? Yes, amongst other things. Much of my time is spent instructing people in the art of climbing an activity I believe to be extremely important. For when climbing a mountain, one has to confront the greatest of dangers with the greatest of prudence. To climb is the accomplishment of putting knowledge into action. Yet, you cannot remain on the summit. You have to come down again. So one may foolishly ask, what is the point? Only that which is above can know what lies below, and so it follows what is beneath has no way of knowing what is above. And these other activities you refer to? Well, there are many and varied, but basically I structure my life so that I spend as little time as possible on the disagreeable tasks uh, that I include in my day for the sole purpose of making money. My background in science and technology has assisted me well on this matter. This income affords me a modest lifestyle and it enables me to spend the greater part of my day researching amongst other things, this very expedition. This has, on and off, occupied the greater part of my life. And as a result, I have spent much of my time delving into many diverse disciplines, which, as I said earlier, led me to, at one point, to spend some time in a monastery. Although much of the time I spent there, I occupied myself with inventing what could only be described as curious objects, such as uh, a pillow that abruptly deflated with absolutely no warning for the unfortunate user. Similarly, I designed a pen that squirted out copious amounts of ink at random intervals. Segal is a curious fellow, but having said that, he is without doubt one of the most intelligent men I have met to date. His background may be in science, but his knowledge and indeed curiosity know no bounds. This at least in part explains why I agreed to protect this expedition. I suspect it is he alone that I would have been prepared to follow. Explain to me why so few are willing to partake in such an expedition. Is it the fact that the geographical destination was unknown? It was not simply that the geographical location was unknown, but the fact that it had no visible presence. Undoubtedly few would involve themselves in such an expedition, and many viewed me simply as having gone mad. 
My friends and colleagues fervently disapproved of such companions. Yes, it came as a shock. Frankly, one does not expect to be treated in such a hostile manner, especially by one's friends and acquaintances, but perhaps they were merely concerned for us. Perhaps. But all too often people can behave in a disagreeable manner when what they have come to believe is challenged in any way. You see, it is as if you are set completely adrift without any frame of reference. Clearly, rational inquiry no longer served you as it once did. It is, as they say, like looking for night in broad daylight. It is an immense task to extend the realm of the possible, but we are far too quick to label something impossible. And there is little doubt that you live in a world where rational thought continues to hold many in captivity. Yes, I would certainly agree. But perhaps it is not quite as straightforward as that. It never is, is it? Because it is not simply a matter of freeing thought from the constraints of rationality, but to free thought itself, given that it is thought itself that produces and shapes our very perception of reality. In fact, we see and understand reality according to our thoughts. Is it not the case that everything we encounter in our society is a product of thought? Yes, your thoughts are in fact a part of reality, and you are not just thinking about it. You are thinking it. Precisely. Then one must receive what thought is not prepared to think, for this, and only this, deserves the name of thinking. And as Plato clearly pointed out, things are defined as much by what they deny as by what they affirm. Does not a simple container also define that which is outside or beyond its capacity to contain? For far too long we have been governed by reason, rationality, and indeed, as we have just discussed, thought itself. Without doubt, rational thought provides us with a splendid instrument of which to comprehend life and indeed the world, but only up to a point. It would be a grave mistake to imagine that it is the only instrument available to us. The will, together with the soul, may ascend. The intellect seldom does. It is time to look deep within yourself into the very depths of your soul, where both reason along with the power of the imagination reside. Alone and when separated, they lie both exhausted and immobile. But when united, a new world awaits one, a world both familiar and disquieting, a wonderful world where the miraculous awaits all. This union, as yet unnamed, a new guiding force, it is there within us is clearly open for all to discover. When the waves of thought no longer rise and fall upon the surface of the mind, it becomes like a calm, pellucid pool in which the sum of this union can reflect upon itself without difficulty, without distortion. But sadly, there are far too few who choose to see. Some in their youth did, but as time passed, they lost their natural courage, and with this they chose not to. They chose not to open their eyes out of fear, for there are rules and laws that one must adhere to, and one must not forget that, for without rules there would be no order. It is important for them to continually remind themselves of this fact, because this is how they defend their decision not to see. This is unfortunate. Many choose simply not to see, not to believe. Many choose not to make up their minds one way or the other. This is the unfortunate consequence when one exclusively adopts a scientific viewpoint which argues that scepticism is always preferable to the unproven belief. But this is nothing short of putting a stopper in one's heart, instincts and courage. Are people willing to wait till doomsday until they have enough evidence to make up their mind? The simple fact is that mankind needs to believe, for belief leads to action and mankind needs to act. Fortunately, there are always a few like your good selves who will choose to look, even if they are enveloped by darkness. They will see, 
for their eyes are open. And so the ties will loosen and eventually give way, freeing them from the rules that once bound them. Yes. Perhaps one has to be grateful for such small mercies. Perhaps some may believe again. For once in their youth, they too looked in the deep shadows. For it was there that they encountered others who dared to dream of a better world. Speak to me of your voyage thus far. I am little versed in nautical matters to speak of any incidents which may have affected the course of navigation, but to surmise, the voyage proceeded not without some difficulty as was only to be expected. Having set sail from La Rochelle in a boat named, some would say appropriately, the Impossible, we made a number of stops throughout the course of the journey. The first being at the Azores, followed by Guadeloupe and finally at Colón. From there we set sail and having passed through the Panama Canal, we entered the South Pacific in late September. Or was it early October? It was the first week in October, the 5th to be precise. Yes, that is correct. For I recall it was in entering the South Pacific that you, Seagal, finally explained to us in some detail how we would eventually gain access to the invisible continent of Mount Analog. This was a pivotal time and divided the journey into two sections. For although there were times when we had to cope with high winds and treacherous seas and there were many demands placed upon us that at times stretched us almost beyond our capabilities, this could be described as no pun intended plain sailing. For there would come a time when we were faced with the inevitable, the proposed point of entry to an invisible continent. Yes, invisible for everything and everyone. All behaved as if Mount Analog did not exist. Entry was another matter entirely, and as you can imagine, much uncertainty surrounded the plan, despite the endless calculations and scientific principles at play. For one to gain access, one must first assume the possibility of its existence. If one wishes to reach it, this is the basic prerequisite. But this by no means assures one access. The only admissible hypothesis is that the shell-like structure which surrounds the island is not at all times impenetrable. That is at least not to everyone. For I had come to believe that at certain moments, at certain places, a certain person may enter. One who knows how and wishes to do so. There remain some issues that as yet had to be resolved. The most pressing of these being that we had to establish the precise coordinates of a point west of the island. This had to be accompanied by particular environmental conditions. There was no room for error, and yet there was no way of calculating these accurately. It was simply a matter of trial and error. Without the correct coordinates and the other environmental factors at play, we would never have gained access. I have little doubt that such concerns increasingly occupied each of our thoughts, but despite this, it was seldom if ever discussed. There are occasions when even language, the greatest tool available to us, fails us. To quote Novalis again, to discuss that which is unknowing can only lead to endless speculation. It is said that one could not conceive of the origin of language without positing first an absence of objects. If this is so, then this amounts to making language an instrument of liberation with respect to lived reality. Indeed, language is an instrument of liberation, for words are far removed from the reality which they represent. This, of course, is its strength, but it would be a mistake to believe it is the only instrument available to us, for does not everything except language know the meaning of its existence? Trees, planets, rivers, time know nothing else. They express it moment by moment, as does this universe. Even this fool of a body lives it in part, and would indeed have full dignity, but for the ignorant freedoms of our rambling minds. Whatever the reason may be as to why we did not discuss these strange occurrences that ensued amongst us, in truth, we may never know. We can only speculate, but there seems little purpose in doing so. But a change occurred, a sea change took place. It was as if the mutinous force of reason had stumbled and fallen overboard unnoticed by us as his duties were promptly taken up by an intuitive force. A belief, 
a belief which had come to resemble more and more the acquiescence of reason itself, so that it became increasingly difficult to distinguish the two. So it became progressively more difficult to distinguish belief from fact. It came to be that your beliefs created for you the facts. Indeed, it became increasingly hard, if not impossible, to discriminate between the two. How and when these changes took place remains something of a mystery, and it clearly would be a mistake to look for any singular cause. I suppose if one had to give an account of this versatile mental state, it could be best observed in dreams or psychotic symptoms where rational correction is reduced to a minimum. So, in short, each of you came to believe. Yes. Each of us came to believe, each of us came to understand that the lines between the familiar and the complex, between the so-called real and the unreal, had in truth never been defined. Conventional wisdom would have us believe it to have been so. And if one challenged that, one was severely rebuked for defying reason. Yet the only means of being reasonable is not to claim to be free from all that which is unreasonable. We should on no account remove ourselves from the effects of the unreasonable, but embrace it. It should be kept close to us, accessible, so familiar that we may constantly pass through it. This, I think, would be an appropriate time for you to give an account of how you finally gained access to the shores of Mount Analog. It was necessary to approach the invisible continent from the west, precisely at sundown. This is because at that moment, as Franklin's experiment with the heat chamber clearly demonstrates, a cool offshore breeze blows in towards the overheated lower layers of the atmosphere of Mount Analog. Thus, one may deduce, we would be sucked in towards the interior, whereas at dawn and from the east, we would be violently driven off. Furthermore, this result was symbolically predictable given that civilizations in their natural process of degeneration moved from east to west. So it follows, if one wished to return to the source of things, one has to travel in the opposite direction. But having once reached the region located to the west of Mount Analog, as Sogol has said, there was no way of establishing the precise point of entry, so it was required of us to grope around a little, yes. Grope. And what this amounted to was that we would patrol at half speed back and forth in a sustained effort within this region. This was to last for almost two months. As the days turned into weeks, and the weeks to months, there must have been times when each of you lost heart. I am sure that I speak for each of us, but please feel free to correct me if I speak out of turn. There were times when the search seemed to be without end. But despite this, each of us maintained our belief that in time we would gain access. As you have said, the will may ascend along with the soul, but the intellect seldom does. Would each of you agree with Sogal's observations? It is easy to agree with the advantage of hindsight, but to have faith is to believe in that which is often considered theoretically impossible. For does not the test of one's belief lie in a willingness to act? Yes. Faith is marked by a readiness to partake in a cause, to involve oneself in what could be viewed by some as preposterous. To fill the difficult hours after twilight, we often swapped stories. Also, I recall an issue, a concern which arose intermittently, I guess an oversight of sorts. What would we use as a means of exchange on our arrival, given that we did not possess anything of value? Of course, but when one encounters a superior being such as your good self, I ask you, what would be a suitable item with which to barter? I am reluctant to accept the title of superior being, for I assure you that our differences are few and our similarities are much greater. But one does not set out to acquire something in a foreign country without a supply of money. Even in the past, explorers would carry with them all sorts of knick-knacks, knives, mirrors, souvenirs, trinkets, not to speak of devotional objects. But it was not merely an issue of what was of value, it was more a case of what mankind possessed of any real worth? With what could we pay for this knowledge we were seeking? Would we have to accept it as charity? There was little need to have concerned yourself with such matters of finance. 
For here, each new arrival or group of arrivals receives an advance in the form of tokens that will cover all initial expenses. This is extremely thoughtful, a truly generous gift. This, you understand, is not a gift. It is understood that it will be paid back in full during the course of one's stay on Mount Analogue. But how is one in a position to pay back this advance? The only true means of repaying one's debts in full is in peridams. The peridam is a stone, spherical in structure, variable in size. This stone is so perfectly transparent, its index of refraction is close to that of air, in spite of the crystal's great density. It is the only substance, the only material thing, whose value is recognized on Mount Analog, and as such it remains the basic standard of all currency. So in many respects it could be equated to gold, which, as you may know, is used throughout much of the world as an economic standard. Yes, I suppose there are some similarities, but the paradigm has many unique properties which I have yet to explain. Perhaps this would be an appropriate time to explain something of the economic and political structure of the region. It would certainly be of great interest to us. The economic life of this region is simple, though animated. Here, everything begins and ends with the paradigm. The paradigm is extremely rare, and a search may be both arduous and dangerous, for they are rarely found in the lower slopes. Given the treacherous conditions that one may encounter in an effort to acquire them, not to mention that a search may last for years, for these reasons, many people become discouraged, and as a result, settle on the lower slopes, where they look for other means to repay their debts by means of tokens. Some become farmers or fish the sea, Others may become stevedores, store owners, or work in any number of trades available to them. All such employment would be paid in tokens. I can assure you that we hold no ill feelings toward them, for they have made it possible for us to buy supplies, rent mules, hire porters, etc. And what if one is unable or indeed unwilling to pay one's debts? Well, how should I put this? When you raise chickens, you give them grain, which they have to pay back with eggs once they become hens. When a pullet doesn't begin laying at the proper age, what becomes of it? So I imagine, as a consequence, few renege on their repayments. Yes, that would seem to be the case. Incidentally, as we were being escorted here, I noticed, I do not wish to cause offence, that the land was being farmed with what could only be described as antiquated means. I assure you I am not offended in the least. All use of machinery, whether it runs on gasoline or electricity, or indeed any other means of power for that matter, is prohibited. So in many respects it would share many similarities to a European town during the last century. Given that this settlement is largely European in origin, in many respects, yes. It has its churches, its municipal council and its police force. But the similarities end there. For all authority comes from above. That is, from the higher mountain guides who delegate and administrate the town and its constabulary. So all people in authority are mountain guides? Yes, but not all guides are in a position of authority. So how is one granted a position of authority? And when granted, does it remain unchallenged? Yes, all authority is uncontested for it is based on a simple process of who has acquired the most paradigms. A system, you would agree, that can in no way be disputed. You mean to say that it's based exclusively on who has acquired the most paradigms and no other attributes are required? I mean, surely this can't be the case. Oh, but it is the case, exclusively. Allow me to explain. As I've already said, the paradigm is extremely difficult to find and a search may last for years. But perhaps more importantly is that the paradigm reveals itself only to those who seek it with sincerity and out of true need. Then, and only then, does it make its presence known by emitting a tiny but brilliant sparkle, rather like that of a raindrop. So the paradigm possesses such perfect transparency that it escapes the notice of all except those who are inwardly prepared and outwardly situated to catch sight of its tiny glint. Yes, exactly. This is nothing short of extraordinary. I mean, forgive me for jumping to conclusions. The very fact that it reveals itself to those who are truly deserving makes it an exemplary way of deciding who is granted a position of authority. Yes. It has proven itself over time to be a very effective system. 
And to return to what we discussed earlier, if I may be so curious to inquire as to why all use of automated machinery is prohibited. It was decided many years ago by the authority of the time that the environmental impact would be too great. Concurrently, it was agreed that a society which is in a state of continual progress is a society governed by progress and the false promises that progress pretends to deliver. The simple fact is that the future will never deliver a better future. Just as the present cannot alter the past, so it is that the future cannot readdress the present. Only the present can alter the future. Just as to live in hope is to live in expectant ignorance, to ignore that which is. It is preferable to live without hope, for to live without hope in fact implies action. For one must live and act in a permanent nowness. Hope does not exist because it can only occupy the future, and as such it's quite useless. No doubt during your time here you'll become more familiar with our customs. But for now, if we may return to where you left off, Sogal, you are giving an account of how you finally gained access to our shores, to the shores of Mount Analog. They were difficult times. The waiting was further compounded by the fact that with the coming of each new day, there was only those few moments of hope and expectant curiosity each evening. Yes, those few moments just before the sun was about to disappear over the horizon. At sunset, we would take up our position, desperately hoping that this would be the moment when we would finally gain access. Then, one evening as we waited tense in the bow of the boat, the sun behind us about to disappear once more, a wind arose with little warning. No, it was not a wind. It would be more appropriately described as a suction, a powerful suction, which suddenly pulled us forward, at which point an opening appeared before us, a horizontal abyss of air and water, impossibly entwined. The boat creaked and was hurled forward, unerringly along a rising slope as far as the centre of the abyss, and as suddenly as the event occurred, we were set adrift in a wide, calm bay in sight of land. We had arrived, for we had believed. Sadly, few believe in the existence of this world. In spite of the fact that a light shone for them, a star overhead to guide them, beckoning them to follow. Then came reason and the mockery of the world. Then came faint-heartedness and apparent failure, weariness and disillusionment. With this, they lost their way, so it came to be that this place began to be dismissed as merely allegorical, believed to be an impossibility. Nothing more than a legend. But one must not be misled by such untruths. Sadly, mankind is all too ready to accept such a position for that which cannot be readily explained or understood is all too often dismissed as a myth or legend or indeed simply as absurd. This, as you know, has many far-reaching effects. For the only way progress can occur, for man's elevation to take place, is by the denial of the actual. That is, by a renunciation of the everyday world for the beneficence of an ideal realm where the veils of actuality are removed to reveal the ontologically determining force of love. So on your arrival, you were greeted by a number of boats it almost seemed as though we were expected. Each boat was manned by ten oarsmen. They came out to tow us to a safe anchorage. When the boat was securely fastened, we were taken ashore and we were promptly escorted here in silence. <laughs> 